Oh my god, what am I doing? Good afternoon. Welcome to Just Thinking Out Loud. My name is Desiree and I'm speaking with Chris Shelton. He, well, I'm about to allow him to introduce himself, but I made the connection with him through a fan of mine, well, two fans of both of ours um, last year. And it's been months, but we finally <laughs> decided to sit down and do this interview. And uh, we're going to be talking about cults and relating it to what I talk about a lot, which is culture and politics. Um, so hi, Chris. Thank you for coming on the on Just Thinking Out Loud. And why don't you introduce yourself in your own words to the audience? Awesome. Thanks very much for having me. This is going to be fun. Uh I am a former Scientologist of 27 years. I got out of Scientology about six years ago, six or seven years ago now. Yeah, what, seven years? Yeah. And um, it's been a bit of a crusade. I've been a bit of an activist against control authoritarian groups. Same thing. Um, and I've been doing a lot of research, education, video work on through a YouTube channel. Um, I've written a book about Scientology. It's called Scientology A to Zenu. <laughs> um, and uh, that's kind of how I spend my life now, interviewing people who have been involved in cults, uh, not just Scientology, but all kinds of spectrum of, of groups. And I've done interviews with uh, therapists, that sort of thing, and counselors. And so that's the kind of work that I do now. And uh, I have a lot of fun doing it. Okay, yeah, I've checked out very recently a couple of videos on your channel. I, which is something, this is something I'm going to sort of get into, though not to the particular case. But it was really interesting hearing you talk about, I mentioned it to you in the email, a figure who I've listened to online, like an online media personality, and taking it from that perspective because of, is this cult-like behavior? Because in my mind, I would never have thought that. But then when I listened to the actual conversation, it made sense. And I thought I would be like slightly defensive, but I, as like the longer the conversation went on, the more and more like it actually made sense uh, what you were saying. Um, so like the first thing I wanted to ask you is just the basics. What is sure. a cult? Okay, cool. So yeah, let's do this. Um, all right, so a cult. So the word cult is very loaded language. People have a lot of baggage connected with that word, which is why it's very difficult to use. I've tended to try to clarify a destructive cult is what I'm talking about. You know, these groups that actually cause some kind of destruction with people's lives, whether it's financial, whether it's psychological, physical, you know, they, these groups can be pretty damaging to people. But it really, to simplify it, it really comes down to three basic uh, concepts, which is uh, separatist, extremist, and authoritarian. And I take those three things from my friend Christian Zerko, who has, you know, sort of really simplified it down. You can you can oversimplify, but I think those three points pretty much cover what we're talking about with cult with destructive cults specifically, these high control damaging authoritarian groups. So to if you look at authoritarianism, separatism and extremism on a sort of a spectrum, then, you know, once you start going too far over, leaning, you know, too far on these things, that's when you've got problems and that's that's where these groups can become problematic or difficult so do you go in my mind when you uh separatist is like the lowest term and then extremist and then authoritarian or like what where does the continuum go from like a group i guess Ex an extremist group to one that's trying to control everyone within it like uh, where is that continuum or where do the terms lie on that continuum oh sure well okay so separatist of course has to do with separating s the group from society as a whole or the rest of culture right so the more separate the more us versus them kind of thinking is going on in the group would be your sort of measure of separatism Extremism is is intensity of belief, and with the more extreme a group becomes, that the more intense the belief system, the more dogmatic, the more rigid, the more structured, and and um, and you know you kind of the, these rules must be followed, these beliefs must be 
complied with or complied to. And then, of course, authoritarian is where you have an authority figure. And all cults, all of these groups have some central figure or group of, of figures uh, who are the authority. And all of the members of the group look to that figure to literally tell them what to do, how to act, how to dress, and in extreme cases, how to even think. And so those are sort of the three characteristics. There are other ways of looking at this or framing it. There's Yanya Lalich's uh, checklist of destructive cult characteristics where you have uh, groups that are very focused on money, for example. Money tends to be a thing, but it can also be power or sex or domination. That can be the thing that's driving the cult leader to do what he's doing and what the followers are giving to him. Um, you know, so these these kinds of things are are how we define these groups. Okay, that is very helpful because I realized that you were talking about you're talking about three different dimensions of a cult. Whereas when I heard it, I was thinking they were all measuring the same thing, and I was thinking where do they lie on the on the scale? That's how I heard it first. But these are three different things, and you measure each thing separately. Um, so I guess the next question would be, how do you scale it from one to 10 for each of these dimensions? Well, you're looking at, uh, again, these different dimensions are aspects of any group almost, right? I mean, almost any group is going to have an authority figure. Almost any group is going to have a certain degree of, well, what makes you a group member? clearly a set of characteristics that that separate you from the rest of society or the rest of the group that you're in in some fashion right boy scouts have uniforms boy scouts take a pledge boy scouts go hiking and camping so that separates them from the activities of the rest of the world but it doesn't make the boy scouts a destructive cult all groups have that right and of course then there is extremism now extremism is where we get into it real problems because extremism has to do with mindsets and the more a person is buying into black and white thinking um you know it's very much this way or the highway there can't be any other way of looking at the world or framing this subject matter that's extreme that's where extremism comes in at the opposite end of extremism on a scale or spectrum would be give and take, live and let live. You think what you want, I'll think what I want, and we'll all just get along fine together. What's the problem? Extremism is no, it's not okay that you think what you think. It's not okay that you act the way you act. You have to comply with what I'm saying, what I'm believing, what I'm doing, or what I'm demanding. And that's where these things play out. Okay. Uh, I think my, my first reaction to hearing what you're saying is, What's the difference between the, or is the difference between extremism and authoritarianism, the allowing of, of uh, people to think differently? Because to me, they, they sound very similar. Um, it's just in one for authoritarianism, there's an enforcement aspect versus, mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess you're just rejected or something um, when you, if you don't think as extreme as you're supposed to. Well, let me give an example from the real world then of, let's say, a conspiracy theorist. Here's an example of somebody with an extremist belief system, but there's not necessarily an authority figure over overseeing this person, this conspiracy theorist, and telling them what to think, what to believe, what to do, issuing them their dogma on a daily basis, demanding compliance with their orders, demanding money from them or their time or, you know, servility or whatever. So there's a difference there, right? You can have somebody get into an extremist mindset without being in a cult. The authoritarian aspect of this is that there is a leadership uh, component. And with these groups, there has to be. That's why we call them cults, right? It's because they are groups that are led by individuals. Um, and that individual or that group of individuals are going to act in, a, in an authoritarian manner. 
they're not going to be interested in your criticism of them. They're not going to be interested in your feedback about how they're doing unless your feedback is you're wonderful and awesome and I ho and I worship the ground you walk on. That's that's the kind of feedback that cult leaders are looking for. They're not they're not it's not a live and let live sort of, well, why don't you tell me how I should be doing my job better? The authoritarian cult leader is this is how it is. This is how reality works, and this and if you don't do what I say and you don't fall in line with my orders and directions, then you're out of here. That's the authoritarian component. Okay, so that response about leadership sort of brings me to my next question, which is the first question I always had or used to have when I heard anybody talking about cults because they would describe someone who was popular usually and who had a following as a cult, and I think about it, and in, in my mind, I usually err on the side of this is not a cult. This is just someone who has a very big personality, and then people start to idolize them and follow them. Like it's, it's something that happens in, I think, in any group. You have some people who they have bigger personalities, they're more charming, they're more extroverted, for example, and then people flock to them. It's, it's something that a lot of people do, and a lot of people, I would describe them as having that's not um weaker i guess you could say personalities in terms of like they're they're they don't have uh if you could think of as you go through life you have like something you're aiming at they don't have it for themselves and so they like latch on to someone else's idea or something like that and i think it's just something that happens sort of naturally that's what i've always thought and so even though you can say that like a person um, has a cult around them, it's to me, it's like, well, don't a lot of people have cults around them if you're going to call that a cult. And I guess the distinction is perhaps whether or not they encourage it or how they encourage it or how they respond to other people responding to them. But I almost feel as if a lot of times the blame is put on the leader, but people want that. Like they want <laughs> to, you know, like sort of give themselves away and have someone else's like mental model of the world or how they want to live their life put in them and the, so that they have like something to hold on to. Well, very much so. Uh, you know, cults are possible if if we didn't have tribalism as a sort of almost instinct within us. Uh, this is how we're built. We, we need to be social. We must connect with other human beings. We must have interaction. And for most human beings, they, they must have some degree of, of instruction and guidance, thus giving themselves over to an authority figure of some kind. And of course, in modern society, this is not just an option anymore, it's essential. We have technology now that none of us understand. We don't know how to fix our phone. We don't know how to go make a lasagna. We don't know how to, you know, make a frying pan. I mean, how do we do these things, right? We're not all individuals who just operate as little islands. We rely on one another. So that being the case, there are a certain percent of the population who see other people as tools as things with which they can use to take advantage and gain social status. There's, you know, social hierarchies, of course, are, are crucial to this as well and understanding how those work. So it is very definitely a codependent relationship. I, when we're talking about destructive cults or high control groups, authoritarian groups, we can use different terms for this. But what we're talking about is the authority figure has to have followers. Otherwise, he's not much of a cult leader, is he, right? So he has to have them. They, they are essential to his well-being that he has people who hang on his every word, let's say. And I'm using the generic his here. It could apply just as well to females as well. It's not gender specific. Um, then you have uh, the followers, and the leader fills a need for them. They are looking for answers. They're looking for some direction in their life. 
But the crucial part of destructive cults and real authoritarianism is that there is an aspect of uh, deception involved in the control that is used, right? They control through lies, through half-truths, through gaslighting, through you know, psychological mechanisms of control that are used that manipulate a person unduly. And this is a this is a very important aspect of it. It's sort of implied with authoritarianism and extremism. But we, ha- if we're going to get into the into the details of this, then we have to make it clear that these are leaders who use deception as a knowingly as a tool to control people. So yes, people want to be inv- involved in groups. They want to get along with one another. They want to have something to believe in. But no one wants to be lied to. No one wants to be taken advantage of, and no one wants to be led down, you know, a garden path to black do blackmail, whether it's emotional blackmail, psychological black, or actual financial blackmail. Uh, no one wants to be led down that garden path and find out that they're now boxed in, you know, where they've lost their money, they lost their family because you know, family members will shun them or disconnect from them if they start bucking the system that they've now become involved in. So a key part of this is that no one's telling you up front everything that you're actually going to be asked to do or asked to perform or asked to believe. If you to- if, if for Scientology, for example, if you walked in on day one, and they said to you, it's going to cost you half a million dollars to get to OT level three, where we're going to tell you that 75 million years ago, the intergalactic leader Xenu committed galactic genocide here on Earth by exploding atomic weapons in volcanoes and disembodying trillions of, of entities that we are now, you know, part of. Well, you might look at them a little askance and go, I don't know that I really want to buy into that, much less give you $500,000 before you're going to give me all those goods. That's That would be true informed consent, but you don't get informed consent with any of these groups. On day one, they're telling you what, what you want to hear, not what they're actually doing. Okay. Uh, so I thought about two things. One, yep. I was... I was thinking about the political stuff, but before I get to that, just yep. now because you mentioned this Scientology stuff, is that level of absurdity, if that's a word, is that common in cults where the, the become stranger and stranger? And like, is there like some kind of psychological thing where because you bought in at the beginning, you, you just keep ignoring like how much stranger it gets? I, I don't know. I'm just wondering if that's like a like a typical thing. There is a, a broadly there is a thing called sacred truth, and these groups tend to focus around or have a dogmatic system of belief that demands that you believe or buy into their version of truth or reality, and one for one these groups have an altered version of what we might call objective reality. You know, there are things that are, tr- that are true. You, prove, you can prove that things are true. You can prove that things are false. For example, Xenu and his, thing, you know, his, his band of, of uh, genocidal you know, overlords who executed this plan 75 million years ago, well, there's a lot of factual problems with that story. Right? If you listen, if you go to science and you get geology, astronomy, you know, these things, you can see all kinds of holes in these stories and not not to mention the fact that there's zero physical evidence for it. So you go, well, that doesn't really seem like an accurate reflection of reality. Well, it's not. But if you get a whole bunch of people to buy into that idea, for them it is. For them it's reality. And and that's how they then proceed. And so you do get these sort of strange ideas that are wrapped up in this cloak of sacredness, of, of sacred knowledge or sacred truth. And this is one of the key aspects of why people buy into these groups and become such fervent followers is become they, they become convinced that their version of reality is the only true version and everybody else is being fooled. 
or deceived in some fashion, and they're the ones who have the actual truth. And this is, a, again, this is, it doesn't have to be crazy ball beliefs, but it tends to be. It tends to go in that direction with these groups, which is another reason why they're destructive. They deny science. They deny the realities of day-to-day -day life because they have the secret. They have the power. They have these ideas that are counter to objective reality. Doesn't mean people won't buy into it. Okay, well, I, I don't know much about Scientology. Pretty much the only thing I know is I watch, like, one of your videos and, like, what you're telling me now and, like, Tom sure. Cruise and the stuff. Like, I, I just know, like, very, very, like, surface-level stuff. Um, sure. But when I hear you say that, I think about uh, religion on a whole and, say, mm -hmm. Christianity, for example, which, if you're talking specifically about science, also doesn't match up. And I think about how I was raised uh, Christian, and I mean, I, I stopped going to church when I was like 14 for multiple reasons, one of which was that, was that it didn't make sense. Um, however, I could distinguish, I mean, I still distinguish now and even then that just because you hold a certain title doesn't mean you're like everybody else in that group. So it's like people can have these commonly held beliefs, but then I see them act them out in different ways. And in my mind, when you're talking about the Scientology stuff and uh, Xenu, whatever, that sounds super out there. But if enough people believe it, 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 I think it wouldn't sound that out there. And for me, the distinguishing thing that would make it destructive isn't necessarily all those crazy beliefs. It's the other stuff you were talking about. And I know like Scientology is a bad example because it's not like Christianity where a lot of the, the myths or the sacred stuff are um, already ingrained in the culture. Um, and I think you could make some arguments for like metaphorical stuff that's told within narratives that don't actually have to do with the, the physical, uh, actual, literal story. Um, so... I guess the question I'm the, the question I'm asking is: Would you say that for every cult out there, there's like possibly a good side and a bad side, or would you say that it's always gonna be bad if people believe in crazy stuff? Because to me, like that belief in crazy stuff, like there's so many cultures out there that believe in crazy stuff that we think is insane, but they're not necessarily abusing people within their culture or through the cult uh, or there are people who are doing that but then there are also people who aren't doing that even though they they all have that same what we would call crazy uh, religion completely and and we can go down a wrong path if we do spend too much time talking about belief i want to be clear that the belief system is not the thing that makes the group a destructive cult the belief, uh, belief systems are a dime a dozen. There's there's millions of belief systems, and they're through the through history, uh, from Norse mythology to Inca mythology to Christian mythology. That 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 is something you can almost separate out from the reasoning as to why these things are destructive cults. It's not what they believe; it's what they do. And so I'm glad we're highlighting this now because this is an important distinction. Um, you know, if crazy beliefs were the only thing that made a group a cult, well, then every single group <laughs> anywhere <laughs> around would be a cult because everybody's going to look at some, you know, there's 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 no group that has universal acceptance. Right. Not, there, there isn't one. There is not one idea that has universal acceptance among human beings, even the ideas that the earth is round, that we have to breathe that we have to sleep, that you have to pay taxes, or that you're going to die. All of those things, there are people who will deny any one of those. So it, there is no universality of, of, of a belief. There, you know, everybody's got different ideas. So you can't really, you know, hang that, your hat on that and say, well, that's what makes a cult. So instead, what we really try to stress when we talk about this kind of thing is what are, they, what are those beliefs driving people to do? 
And that's where you get into an objective measure of is this destructive or not. For example, you get the JWs, the Jehovah's Witnesses, no blood transfusions, no blood transfusions. Well, people are going to die if they don't get blood transfusions, and Jehovah's Witnesses have died because they refused to get blood transfusions. So is that destructive or is that constructive? Well, you know, I think from an objective external point of view, a useless death that could have been prevented is somewhat destructive. Now, of course, you know, individuals can make up their own choices, but this is the kind of thing we're sort of talking about when we go, well, the belief is running right up against science, right? We're not in 1700 anymore. We're into, you know, we're in 2020. So we've got science now. <laughs> we don't have to die, you know, because of medical problems, for example. That's just one of, you know, many, many, many examples where these, where a group can have an extremism of belief that overrides what we now know to be true. That can, you know, we can save lives, that kind of thing. So uh, there's also, you know, the shunning aspect of these groups, right? Where you break up families, you break up businesses, you break up friendships because of this problem that this person refuses to believe what you believe. That's kind of destructive, you know, especially when you're ripping families apart. So that's where we look at what's actually happening in the real world, not what's happening in the person's, in the group's head, so to speak. Okay. So I think I'm, I'm going to be a little bit difficult in my response to what you just said. So <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what you say makes sense. But I, I kind of think that this kind of behavior is sort of universal because I'm very very high on like openness like I'm like super high like compared to most people but most people are not like me and most people do this kind of shunning telling you like like they're like cultures I feel like ha I mean they have the root word cult they have these ideas about what you can do with yourself what's like good morally and that oftentimes plays out in destructive ways and i i think that it's i almost want to say normal obviously you, you have and this is not trying to i don't know i don't want to specifically bring up any culture i don't want to do that but I think that that kind of behavior, the destructive behavior of being authoritarian or shunning people or being extremist in the ideal ideal. So if you if you met someone, I don't know, it's in some culture different from yours and you heard what you realize the way they see the world, it would just seem insane to you. And I guess that's different from like scientific stuff. Um, because sometimes, well, it, that also depends. Sometimes cultures can't agree on that either. So what I'm trying to say but, is that I think this is, is super common for like human behavior in general. You're not wrong. But let me be clear again that this behavior is dictated by the leader to the followers. It is not up to the individual followers whether they will or will not. Okay, you have a family. You got a dad, mom, two kids. And one of the kids... You know, this, this, this family has been raised in this group. We don't even have to name the group, any group, right? And they've been raised in this group. They all believe this stuff, and it's all wonderful until one fine day, let's say the son, 17 years old, says, you know what? I just don't think I'm down with this belief system anymore. I want to go do something else. And now the rules of the group and the leadership now demand that the mother, the father, and the sister all shun and disconnect from and no longer have any relationship with that son, with the brother. He's out of the family now, and that's how it is. The mom, the dad, the, the sister might all not want that to happen, and yet they have to have that happen because it's being dictated to them. They are being controlled. They're not, there is no power of choice or reasoning or decision on their part. If they're going to stay in the group and follow the dictates of the group, then that kid is out of the family and that's how it is. 
So that's a little bit different from an individual making an individual choice as to whether they are or are not going to be connected with somebody. Okay. I think that <clears throat> I can accept that answer. Okay. <laughs> I can accept that answer. Cool. Um, because, because let's be clear, if you don't want somebody in your life, get them out of your life. That's not, if that's your decision, that's your decision. I got nothing to say about that. But if somebody else has taken it upon themselves to tell you or dictate to you what you sh who you can talk to, who you can be involved with, who you can marry, who you can have sex with, who you, you know, any of this. And these are these are very controlled guidelines within these groups. Um, then I'm going to have a problem with that because that overrides individual decision. And I don't think that's healthy for people. I think it, I think that that is very common. However, I also think it's viewed as um, extreme. So, like, even though it's common, I don't think it's like, at least in the cultures I've been exposed to directly, um, that would be seen as very strange behavior. <laughs> exactly, which is why extremism is one of those three points we brought up at the beginning. Another yeah. way of framing this, and maybe this will be more helpful, and it's a simpler, even simpler way of putting it, and this is something I came up with myself, is that a destructive cult is an abusive relationship. Basically, that's it. That's really what it is. Whether it, and it scales. It can be two people, or it can be two million people. The, the, the scale of the, of the situation is not the thing that makes it problematic. It's the abusive relationship. And the fact that the abuse tends to flow only downhill. <laughs> you know, there isn't, there isn't chances for the followers to abuse the leader. It, it only comes from the top, right? So maybe yeah. with that framing, this will help kind of figure the picture out a little bit more. Yeah, I think I, I want to sort of try and relate this to, well, I already do in my head, but to talk yeah. about how this relates to um, the current political atmosphere, specifically with like self-censorship, getting people fired from, say, jobs, um, and also the social hierarchy stuff with, uh, I don't know, like virtue signaling or like the super extreme with groups like, I don't know, Antifa, and what I assume, um, oh, how do they say it again? Uh, um, I don't, like white nationalists, I don't think they have that power, but if they did actually have that power, um, they would, I think they, it would be something similar to like what Antifa does. So if, do you think that, there is cult-like behavior or that there are cults in say these groups that I'm mentioning starting from the accepted behavior which is like the censorship and the academia stuff like that's kind of accepted a little bit the Antifa too but it's not as accepted and then definitely not with like the white national nationalist groups at least in popular media do you think that you could say that a lot of the political landscape is cult like i mean i guess there's tribalism in general but specifically when it comes to intersectional ideology in the current time oh absolutely yeah absolutely what you see is extremism on display uh, and it, and it's kind of writ large because we have these large groups antifa on the left you have the neo-nazis on the right these are two examples that i've used many times Right. And these are actually opposite ends of the same spectrum. Right. You got this left right spectrum. And so you have Antifa over here on the left going, well, we're going to have to beat up all these people on the right because they're so destructive. And then you got the guys on the right. We have to beat up all these people on the left because they're so destructive. Right. And they just can't wait to get at it. So that's right. that's extremism. That is right there. That's what that is. Are they little destructive cults? Possibly. They, they, those could develop in that extremist environment, but I'm not going to say Antifa as a body is a destructive cult. There is no central leadership to Antifa. It's this disparate group of people all over the world who identify as anti-fascists. 
well, okay, I'm anti-fascist, so therefore I'm with Antifa, right? And, and maybe you can be with Antifa and fight fascism without having to be violent, without having to be ex an extremist about it, with, without putting helmets and goggles and baseball bats and body armor on and going out and beating people up at, at, at rallies or protests or demonstrations. Be Antifa without having to go to the extremist mindset, but it turns out a lot of these guys are pretty extremist. One of the things that defines extremism is that there, there's an irrational loyalty or an irrational commitment to this cause, and so they will not even contemplate or entertain an idea that could be non-extremist. You know, for for two or three days, I was getting I was getting uh, hammered by Antifa on Twitter, which is you know not really a big deal, but it was funny and interesting that the reason they were hammering me for days on end is because I made the suggestion to them that perhaps preemptive violence wasn't the only solution to solving the neo-Nazi problem. And by preemptive violence, I mean they showed up insisting that they had to commit violence against the neo-Nazis first, before the neo-Nazis even came out. Because we know the neo-Nazis are all about violence and given, give them an inch, they'll take a mile. So we have to stop them before we even give them an inch. So we got to start throwing rocks at them and go beat them up before it even becomes a violent situation. We're going to be the ones to make it violent. And I was like, guys, guys, guys. <laughs> you know, there are other ways of doing this. I mentioned Daryl Davis, right? He's a, he's a uh, wonderful activist. He's a black man, and he has had conversations with many, 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 many members of the KKK. Oh, I think about 200 of them, he said. And he's deconverted them from the KKK with conversation. But these Antifa guys don't want to hear it. They don't got time for that. All they got time for is beating people up. So this is why I was getting hammered, and I just thought, wow, this is fascinating to watch this in action. So is it a cult? Well, it doesn't really fit all the characteristics, but is it extremist? Absolutely it is. And you, see, you can see extremist behavior without it having to be a cult. The common, the common thing there that binds that, that, those ideas together, of course, is the extremism. Cults are all extremists. You know, that's what that's what makes it that way. So, they, they, you know, the simple way I put it is they just take the dial and they turn it up to 11. <laughs> you know, something's in my eye. Excuse me for a moment, but something just suddenly. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's OK. Are you good? I think I'm OK now. Yeah, it was just weird. Suddenly okay. there was something happening in my eye. Yeah. Um, OK. Would you say that uh, you said that Antifa, for example, or neo-Nazis, which is a better term than what I said, which is white nationalists, I was, I was trying to find the right word. Would you say that them not being a cult, but displaying extremist behavior, that that also applies to, I guess, the softer, more insidious, in my opinion, version of that, which is like getting people fired from their jobs or academia they like people can't do things that i don't know 10 years ago maybe they could have done um because their opinions aren't okay anymore or is that because it has options to do other things that doesn't count or is 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 similar to the antifa thing where it's just some things like maybe the separation bit but not other stuff yeah, what you see there is just if you imagine this spectrum and you go zero, the center of the spectrum, and you go out, 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 out. Well, the violence is at the, is at the ends, is at the extreme ends. So that's where you have Antifa sitting, for example, because they just can't wait to just beat up on people. You move in a little bit and you get the and you get what you're talking about. It's a it's a progression, right? And the progression of the black and white thinking. It's my way or the highway. If you don't comply, we're going to destroy you. We're going to destroy your life. We're going to destroy your career. We're going to destroy your family, destroy your finances. We're not going to come beat up on you physically. We're not at that end. We're not that far out yet. 
right? But we're in this range over here where it's like we're going to do everything but physically beat you. And that's and that's just on its way over and it's just a more of the dialing the extremism and the black and white thinking up to 11. The less you can include, sorry, the less you can tolerate other ways of thinking, the more extremist you are. It's pretty simple. And we live in a world where tolerance and understanding are required. They're not optional. If the human race is going to survive, we have to tolerate differences of ideas and differences of opinion, or the species just isn't going to survive. So that's, that's pretty much what it comes down to with that. So that's why it's destructive behavior to allow a belief system to become so fervent you know, so they become so enraptured with their own ideas that they can't possibly contemplate that there could be anything wrong with them or there's some context in which those ideas don't apply. No, they apply every time, everywhere, everybody, right? This is yeah. that black and white thing. So, so yeah. that's what you're talking about there with that. Okay. I yeah. mean, I suspect it's, it's going to be the same thing, but um, if we bring that down to an individual level, where, you know, in the past, I don't know, maybe five years, a lot of people have shunned their family members and friends. Like, that seems insane. Like, like I obviously haven't had that happen. Well, not with my family. Haven't really had that happen. But to me, when I heard about that happening, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, you really know a person in and out when, well, not all of them, but more so than you could know most people in the world. You know them very well if they've been your friend for a really long time, and if, and if they're your family member, you probably know like all their weaknesses and strengths. Like you know a lot about a person. How does that shift overnight? Like I, I, I just like makes no sense to me when I think about it. Because like even if you if you look at someone's politics, yes, someone's politics says a lot about their values, but it's not the only thing. And it's like, I guess it's like the political values overtake everything else in the minds of these people. But that seems like very cult-like behavior to me. But there isn't really necessarily a group because political ideologies are really broad. And the people you connect with, are they're all over the place. It doesn't seem so like localized as like some, like a religion, for example, where you'd go to like your, your church group or, you know, like actually meet up with people every couple week or whatever so would you say that that's not well i'm guessing you're going to say it's not really uh, a cult but that kind of behavior of shunning like like your family like there are many reasons you would you might want to do that but over politics and also because it seems so sudden like it seemed like very it seemed hinged on like the elections going on at that time and the political landscape and it, it almost didn't seem organic from like within a person, but like what they are hearing outside determines how they decided to treat these people differently that they were interacting with for years before. Yeah, we've had a, this has been, it, it actually wasn't super sudden. It's been a growing problem. And this has been something that's been evolving, I think, exponentially since the, since the rise of social media, where we have so much more exposure to everybody else. And their sort of collective id you know, that, that we that we manifest through this social reality called the Internet and social media, uh, which is, you know, it, it, what we're really doing is getting a peek into everybody else's heads. And it was all those things that everybody's commenting on and thinking about. They were always there. In 1980, yeah. people were thinking the same stuff. In 1970, yeah. people were thinking the same kind of stuff. It's just now we can see it. <laughs> so we're like, oh, my God, the world's become so horrible, you know? And it's like, yeah, the world was always this way, man. People were always thinking crazy stuff. But now they're not so – now they don't have such a problem telling everybody else about it. <laughs> <laughs> so we get this inside look, right? So that's a factor. It's not the only factor, but it's a factor as to why people's stress levels have come up 
rather than going down, they come up because they can see this. They see what other people are thinking and and insisting on and, you know, a down with this person or down with that person or I hate all women or I hate all men or I, I hate little boys. I hate little girls. I mean, I hate people who wear red. Yeah. And, you know, you get all this like expression of, of you know, this toxicity that's flying around and, and people have a negativity bias. That's yeah. another thing that's built into us for every, you know, for I think the ratio I figured out one day in my own head was I, I think it's about 50 for every 50 good comments. That's what it takes to drown out one negative comment for me. <laughs> right uh, when I read bad comments on YouTube or on social media about my work, right? I got to read fifty good ones to like drown out the one bad one, and that's that's me. But I know that this negativity bias is a thing that exists. So, so that's raising stress levels too because we pay more attention to the negativity, and there's an awful lot of negativity all over the internet. So that's been a sort of social problem. Uh, then you enter in politics. And the thing about politics is you get cults of personality. If we're going to talk about cults and politics, that's where it manifests. Being democratic, being libertarian, being conservative, being progressive, that's not a cult. That's, that's just ideas you have. And, I, and, and, the, and the reason why it's not a one of the biggest reasons it's not a cult is because Everybody's got their own ideas about what these things are. My idea of democracy, you know, or being a Democrat, democratic values, radically different from even my wife or, or you or, you know, John Atack or John Stewart or any, you know, anybody that we know. There's all kinds of ideas we have. We're not all marching in lockstep one to the next to the next. The thing about cults of personality is that's when people start marching in lockstep. Donald Trump can do no wrong. Everything he says is magical. He's the most wonderful person who's ever been around. And it not just it's not just Trump. You can find that with Hillary, you can find that with, you know, Bernie, you can find that with any of these guys. You build up these little very very fervently dedicated followers. Now, yeah. the 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 other factor though here is what does the person, what does the person who's developed this cult of personality do with those followers? And if that person continues to lie to them, actively deceive them, take advantage of them, take their money under false pretenses, that's when you're developing an actual cult, as destructive cult, as we were, as we've been talking about. So, and yes, there are political leaders who have done that and they have developed, they've taken the, their, their cults of personality. And this gets misunderstood because people think, well, then, then I'm saying, for example, all Trump supporters are cultists. And that's not the point at all. And if you listen carefully to what I'm saying, you can see that not everybody who votes checks, checks marks Donald Trump's name, for example, that, that doesn't make you a cultist, not by any stretch of the imagination. But if I can't talk rationally to you about Donald Trump's policies and whether there are, is some, you know, some, some pros and some cons, and maybe he might have bent the truth here, and maybe there might have been a deception here, oh no, oh no, everything he says is just perfect, and everything he's doing is wonderful, and how could you even think to criticize him? Now you're talking to a cultist, right? So there's a big, wide difference here, you know, and and I and it's important that people understand those nuances, even though getting nuance across these days in politics is a little difficult. Yeah, the first of all, this thing you said about the internet and the negative bias, I actually it's a great um, explanation for why people have become almost more sensitive or I guess they they were never exposed beforehand but it seems like everybody's becoming more that's you're right you probably probably would only say certain things to your friends or people who you know you could you know have a conversation with but now because of the internet one, it's it's easier. I mean, that's what I did with JTOL. I was like, I feel like I can't say something. Let me say it on the internet because then you'll find people that you feel like <laughs> you can have the thoughts that you want to have. 
that you're going to be having anyway. So you're right. I, I do think that um, that has really changed uh, the social discourse and probably has contributed to um, people starting to shun friends or family members because now they know what they're really like. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. Well, there's and then the, then there is a, there's a there's an equally important other component of this which I must comment on now which is also the fact that we are all really bad. And I'm saying this very broadly of course, but we are generally speaking really bad at, in, at engaging with uh, ideas we don't agree with online especially and yeah. we get into the name calling all the logical fallacies that come into play when people are having internet arguments that yeah. and, and they don't even understand one another when they're speaking sarcastically because you can't see sarcasm in a the text they do not understand the emotional nuances of the person they're communicating to so they have no idea what's actually going on with the person they only have the words Excuse me, the words that people use make up about, I don't know, what, 20% of the, of the content of a communication is the words, and then there's all this other stuff that we bring. Just by seeing me, you can see my emotions, my hand gestures, so that my attitude as I'm talking about this. So you don't see any of that so often online, and so we have had years, a couple decades now, of really horrible interactions and interacting on ideas. And the thing that happens when people are faced with opposition and it's not convincing opposition, it's not rational opposition, is they double down on their own belief. You know, I'm being confronted and here's this person who's calling me names and telling me what a doofus I am for believing this idea. Well, you know what my response is gonna be? I'm twice as right. <laughs> <laughs> and that is actually where the divisiveness has come from, is everybody's doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on their beliefs because they, they're not talking to each other sensibly about them. And we're only 20 years into this, 30 years into this, and we're now starting to think about maybe we should be interacting a little more rationally <laughs> with one another because what we're doing ain't working, you know? So that's another part of it. Yeah, I would also add to that that the short attention span also makes it difficult to actually listen to what someone is saying because most of the media is consumed as entertainment even when it's supposed to be about like rational thinking people don't really pay attention in general if it's not provided in like an entertaining way and that generally means making it short it doesn't like interrupt your workflow or the time you set aside to get this done and so I think you only get people in bits and pieces and then you form a, a judgment beyond that. Because something else I wanted to say is that even when you have more than the, the words, you have other communication on like through video, for example, where you're getting a lot. I still think you, you're missing a, a lot of uh, what is behind the thinking of a person because someone is literally their whole life history. It's not just them in the moment and that influences everything that they're thinking. Um, and also as someone who communicates through video, I've seen that like personally. And it's, it's given me insight into now when I think back to seeing magazines or hearing people talking about celebrities when I was younger, I really understand that the public like doesn't really know what they're talking about. Like seeing how people respond to me <laughs> and like knowing that like this person is actually wrong because they like are in my brain. But like that's, that's just something that they can't know, you know. So, yeah, I, I think as well that that contributes to it. Big time. Absolutely, it does. The other things that uh, when you bring up media and the news, of course, is the 24-hour news cycle that started in the 80s, the deregulation of media. So we don't have, you know, the, we don't have to show um, balance. I mean, <laughs> the most hypocritical tagline, right? Fox News, fair and balanced. <laughs> You're like, really? <laughs> but it actually started with CNN. You know, Ted Turner and Rupert Murdoch have done more to destroy people's attention spans than almost any any other two people uh, in the in the whole world. You know, oh, Ted Turner was the one who is was the guy who started CNN, and Rupert Murdoch is the one who runs Fox News. 
owns Fox News, started it. So we have these news stations that, you know, Fox isn't even pretending to be news. They just call themselves Fox News. So you know, so there's a lot of contributing factors to this, hundreds of them. We, we can't reduce this to, to the simplicity of, oh, it's just these one, this one or two or three things. But all of this, all of these things have come together where technology has enabled us to do things that we truly miraculous, wonderful things. I mean, the, don't get me wrong. This isn't some, I'm not trying to say that the internet's destroyed us. It's that it's a double-edged sword and we have to be really, really aware of the, of the pitfalls of the internet as well as you know, singing its praises for all the wonderful things it's done for us. Um, so the short attention span theater that we're experiencing is definitely, definitely a problem. And it's gotten to the point now when our cultures are sort of s s almost centered around this short attention span thing, even to the point now where as a YouTube content creator, I don't know if you've seen this, but I was certainly told many, many, many times at the beginning when I was doing my channel, short content is what's wanted, right? Five, seven, 10 minute videos. If you're, if you're making a video more than 12 minutes, you're off the rails, right? And I was like, really? Well, turns out that's not really true, but that's what was being encouraged. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of interesting, you know? So now we're busting out of that. People are more into long form content that we've, we've shown Joe Rogan has shown, especially long form podcasts are okay. People are okay with spending a lot of time really deep diving on stuff. But I think some of that's been a reaction to the short attention span theater that we've been sort of dealt with for the last 30, 40 years. Yeah, um, I would also say that I, I think it has to do with your audience, too, because uh, I do think that that short, <clears throat> the videos that are really short, I think they get more appeal, even though Joe Rogan is popular. Like, I, I think there are much more popular channels that have much shorter videos. Um, Absolutely. I also, I also wanted to comment on, um, you were talking about the cult of personality um, thing. I, I can't even remember what was my original question, but... Um, <laughs> for this cult of personality thing, this is sort of going back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, I think that it's really hard for any political leader to not have that happen. So like one, one thing is a comment. The first comment is I think that these cults, destructive cults can grow independently of the, the leaders trying to do anything. And then the second thing is a, is a question which is like, what do cult leaders, sorry, not cult leaders, political leaders, <laughs> that's a funny slip up. What do political leaders do to like dissuade uh, like these destructive cults from forming, even though like, I actually think it's almost not possible to, to stop it. Well, I'll tell you, one of the, one of the um, key ways is to literally tell, tell them you know, this is about you guys. I'm empowering you, right? This isn't about me. This isn't about, you know, you don't, don't, it, it's a difficult thing for a leader. The, the only thing a leader can really do in terms of avoiding becoming a cult leader is don't be abusive. Don't lie. Don't, don't, don't deceive your followers. Don't tell them things that aren't, that aren't true, in other words, right? I, I, hey, I'm, I know. It's no, politics. I just, for politics, it's like that's never gonna happen. No, I get it. I get they it. But the truth. they really don't. I, I, <laughs> I, don't I know. I know. Which is why politics lends itself to this so easily. Because that's what they do, you know. Uh, I don't know what to say, you know. But there's, you know, there's a diff. There's a point. There is a difference between just deceiving somebody and then crossing the line over into abusing them, hearkening back to this point about destructive cults being an abusive relationship. Um, right now, just since I can point to this as an example of it, um, you know, right now we have a president who's talking about, you know, how he can't wait to get businesses reopened. And he's thinking about doing that very, very soon in the face of a global pandemic where, you know, the scientists are telling us very, very clearly that uh, separation is the only thing that's going to slow this thing down and save lives. So I think I'm justified in saying that there's a level of abuse in that relationship when you have 
fervent followers who are hanging on your every word who will do what you tell them to do. When you start telling them how to live their life, not just how to vote, but how to actually live their life, and you're telling them to do things that are truly destructive to their good health and well-being, you've crossed the line into becoming a cult leader. And I, and I feel that I'm on pretty solid ground saying that. Well, the, the COVID-19 issue, I'm more for the staying healthy, but I hear a lot of people on Twitter now saying, um, is this worth the cost of like the economic shutdown, etc.? That makes sense to me. But I mean, like, I just don't, I don't know, because I think that it would be abusive if Trump was saying we're going to get businesses reopened soon when he has no intention of doing that. Because in my mind, it's likely for him to say that he's going to do that when he has no intention simply to, to like help people psychologically or cause he thinks it will help people psychologically. Um, but I don't know what the best thing to do is. I kind of started separating myself early. So like I've been on the side of, stopping everything and if they had just done everything sooner then we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now people are taking it seriously but then I think it, it might be true that there could be economic and social fallout that comes from these businesses the economy basically being shut down well half of the economy let's say being shut down so in the, at the end of the day I say I'm glad that I'm not in this position and I don't have to <laughs> make these decisions um I guess what I'm trying to say is that for like for Trump's specific comment about possibly reopening businesses, reopening businesses soon, I think there's a debate going on as to whether or not shutting everything down is actually going to be helpful in the long run versus the like fallout over that. So I don't think it's settled that what he said is necessarily a bad thing, but I don't I don't know. I, I don't know. So. I I cannot sit here and say definitively, positively, absolutely, one way or the other, you know, that is or isn't a destructive thing. Certainly saying something is not in and of itself destructive. I am talking about carrying that out into actual real action in the real world. Uh, you know, another better example of that, of course, would be the Church of Scientology, which has never closed its doors and is actually encouraging people to come in now today for classes to sit in a room with other people and not not particularly manifest social distancing <laughs> you know just come in because we need you studying L. Ron Hubbard's technology right and that has been their consistent instruction from day one COVID-19 be damned right so there might be a more clear example of what I'm talking about but since we were talking about politics I thought I would throw that out there um you know, Donald Trump has not stood at a podium and ordered everybody to go outside or ordered businesses to open or something. So, yes, there are obviously I'm not going to sit here and say that he's the epitome of a of an L. Ron Hubbard, but he has engaged in so much blatant and open deception that it is difficult for me to see him from a non cult leader position. He lines up on a lot of the characteristics. So that's, you know, and this is something I, this, this is the field that I get to say I know what I'm talking about. You know, there are, there are lots of fields where I don't know what I'm talking about. Epidemiology is one of them. I'm not going to sit here and make judgment values about where we're at in the, in the cycle and whether we should or shouldn't be opening businesses. I defer to epidemiologists for that. They all happen to be saying, don't open the businesses right now. So that's why I tend to go in that direction. Yeah. But I get your point. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you that you're absolutely wrong in what you just said. I. I, I can't argue that. I. Mean, I would think that if you were talking about Trump and cult-like behavior, it would focus more on his personality because he's very um, egocentric. I mean, I, I think that's part <laughs> yes. of why he was elected. But I can see like that. But at the same time, this this goes back to the, the people people wanting to idolize someone or looking for leadership. 
I mean, if we took it to the furthest extreme, you know, like, why do we choose to govern ourselves through a like why do we like choose people and like it's because it turns into a popularity content content versus actual ideas you know it's like people myself doing it like if I like someone you know it's like I'm gonna be a little bit more defensive of someone saying something that's against what they're saying versus literally just separating like the person from the idea that's like that's I almost want to say impossible to do like it, it, it's like you'd have to really train yourself and you'd have to really train uh, citizenry to think like that. And politics is, is, is like you said, it's like a cult of, of personalities because it, it plays on our biological evolution, really. Well, very much so. And at the end of the day, we are emotion driven. We pretend <laughs> we are <laughs> driven by the frontal lobes. We're not. <laughs> You know, it, it, our emotions are what drive us. And, and at the end of the day, what that means is that what makes us feel good is what makes our is what drives our decision making process, not the sensible, rational pros and cons. Let me look at this. You know, let me figure this out. We have to be uninvolved with a thing emotionally in order to really play out a pro and con list and make a decision rationally based on that. If you're if you're completely uninvolved with a thing, and this is where the whole concept of judges comes from, but even they <laughs> get to they even you know even a judge okay even a judge is affected by uh, whether he's hungry or not uh, the appearance of the person he is judging the gender of the person he is judging the race of the person he is judging. All of these unconscious biases come into play. So there isn't a gold standard for objectivity among human beings. We just don't have that capability. So all we can do is temper our passions, as the Greeks or, you know, uh, old philosophers of, of old used to talk about, and sort of try to build systems that, that take that into account. And... Uh, we've learned so much about this in the last hundred years that our systems haven't really caught up yet. Our laws are still operating out of the 1800s mentality. They don't even have a recognition that psychology is even a thing or that sociology is even a thing or neuro neuroscience is even a thing. We wouldn't have eyewitness testimony if we, if we really went with neuroscience because our memories suck. <laughs> so, you know, so there's a lot of catching up that our systems have to do. And so there are they are still frail and weak and 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 built on straws in a lot of places. But they've worked. We've progressed. So we go with them, you know. But yeah, let's not pretend that we're making decisions based on rationality. But as as herds of people get together, they are emotionally driven. And yes, that is why Donald Trump, for example, has stood out because he plays on emotional commitments so well. He's a, he's really masterful at it. Uh, you know, politicians tend to be challenged intellectually and policy wise, and those arguments never really hit him. He just played the emotional card the entire campaign and he played the media like a fiddle, and they totally went for it, and they gave him all the free coverage he ever wanted. So, so that's kind of how that happened. And you know, it's a it's a tricky thing in politics because we are there are so many factors that decide our political attitudes, and identity politics hasn't helped because identity politics itself sort of opens the door for cults and cultic thinking because when you because the thing about a cult for a follower for a cult follower is you start identifying yourself as an individual with the belief system or worse with the cult leader themselves you start thinking of yourself in terms of them in Scientology for example when faced with a problem of what to do a Scientologist will ask themselves well what would Ron do and then they will make a decision on their life based on what they think L. Ron Hubbard would do. Yeah. Not what they would do. 
because they are the least important part of that equation at this point. That's the cult relationship, right? It's the cult leader who has all the the truth. So you lose yourself. And identity politics is similar. You, once you start identifying on a single thing and that in, defines who you are, you've given over to a belief system rather than you. And that's where, and that's another place where we lose. Uh, yeah, you, you could have said that uh, better. I, I have a special dislike <laughs> of identity politics and it, the way you just described it as you know like you're you've lost yourself like where are you in i guess the the collective and it's not even the real collective it's it's like one specific stated popular version of this supposed collective it, it's none of it makes sense like when you think about it and i've don't understand I don't really think I'll ever understand beyond like the virtue signaling stuff like maybe people parroting things that they think will help them be accepted in society but the actual logic of it just makes no sense uh, but it, it seems like some people really really buy into it and um, you know I, I wonder if there's a way to to harness this kind of tribal tribalism or need to identify with someone or some group outside of yourself into good like do you think that there's a way to like channel that well or there is no way because once you're trying to do that you're giving up your own individualism and I feel like in order to I don't know I feel like nothing good can actually come from that so it's hard for me to think of a way where that could be used well but this also ties to something else I was thinking of saying but if you know that humanity works like that, would you not just work with it? The other thing I was thinking was, if I were to become a politician, I wouldn't just be logical and rational because I know that it doesn't really work. Like there would, it would, there would be no point in doing that if I actually wanted to get somewhere. So exactly. it's like, what do you, exactly. What do you think <laughs> no, I think you're exactly right. And this is why millions and millions of dollars are spent on research and political consulting every single campaign. There are people whose entire lives, there are psychologists who do nothing but figure out what a politician or a political candidate should wear, what words he should say, what words he should absolutely positively never say, how, what phrases to use, the colors on the imagery behind him or her, the symbolism on the graphics, all of this stuff is like a science. It's not, people think they just throw this stuff together or something or they don't really, they're not really exposed to the behind the scenes of what goes on with these guys, but they are driven by what's going to appeal to the most number of people so that I can get the most number of votes. And that's where it kind of becomes a sociological group thing, right? Exercise in, in, in that. That's where politicians really are living. They're not living on an individual voter. They, they talk about individual voters because they want people to feel individually touched by them. But that's not how they're computing what to say, what to wear, what to do, or what their policy position should be. You know, And it's so, it, so it tends to be this grand show. It's really more almost entertainment. And it's all about appealing to emotions, right? In this state or in this city or in this region or in this part of the country, I'm going to appear on stage with a red tie because surveys show that's what is that's what shows that's what communicates aggressive, you know, strong will. To this group of people. But then when that same guy goes up to, let's say, Seattle or the Pacific Northwest, it's a blue tie because that's the calm, chill, rational, aggressive guy. I mean, I'm just making this up, but you see the, the differences <laughs> I'm talking about here. Like yeah, it gets yeah. that detail oriented. And at that point, you're not you're not pushing policies. You're not talking about legislation. You're not talking about what you're going to do when you go to D.C. for the little people. You're just men, you're just emotionally manipulating people. And that's that's what politics basically is. And unfortunately, if you go back in history, that's what it's always been. 
<laughs> yeah, but is yeah. there a way to do politics? Like, well, is it, I guess you will become corrupted as you do that, but is there, maybe, but there is there a way to do politics without doing that? Because, like, that goes back to the human nature. Like, if you want to get the job done, say, if you wanted to, say, help people actually, well, I personally think in a lot of ways you can't actually help people. They have to help themselves. But say you, like, had this good intention, you wanted to help them. I don't really see a way that you could do that without manipulating them. Like, I, I actually don't think that because they, like, you would get a few followers, but, like, I think for the most part, you wouldn't get anywhere. Which I, I know that sounds like justification to do a bad thing, but I, I just can't, like, see it any other way. Well, and that's the thing, because the moral compass decision points on this are, is your manipulation leading people to a better place or to a worse place? And, you know, and it, and that's, that is an objectively answerable question, but it has to be answered by somebody who's got no involvement with the situation <laughs> at all, right? So that's a little bit difficult, makes it problematic. Um, but at the end of the day, that's really the question that these leaders need to be asking themselves and that we need to be asking of them is, well, I know you're manipulating me, but are you manipulating me in a positive direction or a negative direction? And what we see with a lot of the American public, especially, that I can comment on with some degree of confidence is we have had our trust betrayed so many times by so many politicians that we don't really believe any of them anymore. And that's a shame because it wasn't always that way. That's a development. That's something we've created. We've allowed it to happen in our society. It's a multi-generational thing. It's not on any one person's shoulders. It's a collective thing. And we got to somehow deal with that. That requires a collective will that somehow we don't seem to have. Uh, there are, again, many, many reasons why. Privilege, comfort, you know, stress, difficult. I mean, at the same time, contrasted with the stressful environment that we all live in. So there, you know, so there's a lot going on here with this. But we, at the end of the day, when you talk about, well, can we make a saner political system, not without making a saner society and a more informed society? We're a very low information society in the United States. We're, we're, we're not really aware of the rest of the world or our place in it much less our own position. And then, of course, you have 50 different states united, kind of, in like maybe 13 different countries culturally that exist around, that, you know, there's got, the, you got the, the South, the Pacific, you know, the, the liberal coast, Midwest, you know, you got all these different sectors that are completely different cultures. There's no average American viewpoint. <laughs> you know, there's about 13 of them. So where do you go with this? You know, it's a bit of a mess and it's, it's an organic evolved mess. It wasn't a conspiracy and it wasn't 12 crazy guys who rule the world who made it this way. It's just humans. So can we evolve past this? I believe we can. I believe we can make it better, but we need to get focused on critical thinking and skepticism in our education. We need to really focus on that a lot more than we do. And, um, well, that's just the first of many things we need to change. I don't know if that helps at all, but it's kind of a, it's kind of where I, how I see things in my more lucid moments. <laughs> I, I think that helps. Um, I was going to comment that I think that's part of the reason why the coronavirus um, is so hard because of the the what you were describing as a low information society and people not realizing america's not realizing their place in the rest of the world because i feel as if i've just been watching this train from way far off in the distance and then like people slowly becoming alert but it's like the u.s depends on china for so many things and like so many people travel back and forth and and um yeah i just think that that's related I'm sorry, I missed the last part. It skipped out for a second there. I didn't hear what the last thing you said. Yeah, it's, it's skipping for me too. I was just saying I, I, that I think it's related and it was like a slow train wreck coming 
Um, that's all I said. That's basically okay, got I it. Said. Yes, correct. And and the fact of the matter is that most Americans weren't aware of it until it was thrown in front of their face, or there, or, or worse. Because of the misinformation that was being spread around on cable news, especially all the channels um, and the messaging that was coming out of the White House, let's be super, super clear that it was being, you know, told that it was being exaggerated. It was a Democratic hoax, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that was very, I, 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 heard the, I tweeted about know. that. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, and I was like, that? I saw that, like, I, I remember responding to Trump tweeted something and I was like, we are not prepared and this is not true. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of, that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, well, it was a reflection of a couple of things. I mean, we have American isolationism and, you know, and to a degree, you know, that separatist characteristic that I mentioned at the beginning that applies very much to America. We very much have this weird idea that we're superior to everybody else in the world and we're the only superpower and American exceptionalism and the American dream and all this. And those are all great. They're nice. They're, they're social realities. But we know when the rubber meets the road, we are part of a planet of people. And, and we're not even like the biggest country. I mean, India and China got us way beat on people. So... You know, we 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 really don't get that, and that is a that's a problem, you know. And then there is just denial, straight up psychological denial, and that exists, and that's a problem. So we could really improve this picture a number of ways. <laughs> we could get some things on the rails. Yeah. So I think I've kind of asked you and gone through everything. I Oh, did it freeze again? I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, I think I've already gone through everything I wanted to ask about the cult and the politics. Okay. So I'm ready to wrap up unless you right. have some final final words on the topic, perhaps. Or Let not. me say this. Yeah, no, let me go ahead and say this. Um, just since we are talking about politics and cults and stuff and the cults of personality, you can't avoid cultic behavior. What you can do, because it's ingrained in us, we create it. it we have tendencies in these directions that are primal. We, ha we look to leadership naturally. That's not taught behavior, it's just how we are. We, you know, these things are built into us. So what we have to do is use, we have been gifted by evolution with frontal lobes. Now, we don't necessarily make all of our decisions with our frontal lobes, but we've got them. We've got a potential to do something that no other animal on this planet can do. And we're not well practiced at it. And that is critical thinking, skepticism, and reasoning things through. So if the more attention we can put within ourselves individually on that, the more we can teach ourselves about it, practice it, simple things. Don't make major decisions on the spur of the moment. Always give yourself two or three days because I guarantee you, no matter what your mindset is right now, tomorrow it's going to be different. And the next day it's going to be different. And the day after that it's going to be different. If it's not, you're in a cult. <laughs> you know? So, it, you know, it's kind of natural for us to look at things differently, change our ideas about things all the time. And that is, uh, that's something we should be practicing and reveling in and enjoying, not resisting and thinking we have to somehow comply with the, with the bigger picture, you know. So those are the, those just little stuff like that can actually make a big difference for individuals. And, and I, this is why I encourage learning about and practicing critical thinking so much. It's the only antidote to cults. There isn't any other system that's going to beat them. There isn't any other laws or savior or hero coming from anywhere that's going to save us from cults. We're the ones who create them. So we have to not let ourselves go there by being more rational, skeptical thinkers. Okay. Um, sorry, the video was cutting out a little bit, but I, I heard most of what you said. So thank you for having this discussion. And I definitely learned a little bit. And I think um, we did a good job of going through all the, the ways you can think of politics. Like and sort of broke that down well. Um, my final question to you is where can people find you? 
Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so my website is mncriticalthinking.com. You can look me up on YouTube under my name, Chris Shelton. I identify as the critical thinker at large because I love doing critical thinking as much as I can uh, and encouraging and promoting its use. So I don't identify as the ex-Scientologist at large. <laughs> and, uh, and you can find my book on Amazon, Scientology It Is Inu, and uh, check that out. All right. Well, I'd like to thank my audience also for watching or listening and just reminding you, if you like these conversations, consider donating at justthinkingoutloud.tv slash donate. There are different links when you go there. And uh, as usual, have a great day and I will talk to you soon.